So these are where these materials, even though we're discussing them in an electronic point of view, they've actually been around uh, as consumer uh, products in one form or the other for some time. So in terms of electronics, uh, graphene is uh, the most popular of this material. So let me just use one slide to introduce its basic properties. So it offers, uh, it has this very interesting band structure, which means it's a semi-metal. Uh, the important thing is it has the highest mobility. So for electronic properties, its conductivity is very good, it's electrical conductivity. It has the highest thermal conductivity of known materials. So for thermal management, uh, it's a very, very attractive material. It's the um, uh, most optically transparent material or second most optically transparent. HBN is a little bit more transparent, but its transparency is very broadband. So for optoelectronics is a great interest and for display applications, great interest in graphene. And it's also uh, among the strongest mm -hmm. materials known to man because of the strong carbon-carbon bonded. So if you look at the publications in graphene, which is a measure of the research and entrepreneurial activity in this material, you see there's actually a, a, a huge growth in the publications. We're talking about uh, tens of thousands of papers uh, per year. And these papers are, in, you know, are motivated by uh, uh, opportunity to convert the scientific knowledge discovered in these materials into technology, technology applications to benefit uh, society. So let me use a few slides to give you a snapshot of uh, some of the electronic research areas over the last uh, decade, uh, because this is kind of the 15 year anniversary of uh, the graphenic materials. So transistors is uh, has been the most uh, um, popular applications, a lot of activity because transistor technology, we're talking about semiconductor industry that is trillions and trillions of dollars of uh, our industry. So there's a great interest to see if this 2D materials can advance uh, transistor technology. So the first paper on graphene was published about 13 years ago, which was a graphene field effect transistor. Even though graphene is not a proper semiconductor, it can still be used to make a transistor that is suitable for analog electronics. So in this paper by uh, one of my esteemed colleagues, Max Leme, uh, we see here yeah, the drain current versus the gate voltage, which is a basic characteristic of um, transistors. The important thing here is this work revealed that interfaces were very important in getting the most out of this uh, material. So when, when you didn't have a top gate, you had very good properties, very high current, that's very good. But as soon as you put a top gate dielectric interface uh, on top of this material, uh, the properties degrade significantly. So this motivated further research uh, as to what is the best uh, interface uh, to marry to graphene and similar two-dimensional materials. So as I mentioned earlier, the Columbia University group identified that hexagonal brown nitride was the best material to combined with graphene in order to get the best uh, properties. And so these are the results, uh, a very, very nice symmetry between the positive gate voltage and the negative gate voltage. So when you have the symmetry, that means you have very good quality material. Mobility is approaching 10,000. So that's much, much higher than silicon. Very good for a variety of analog and high frequency applications. So besides transistors, Flexible electronics is also a very hot area. Uh, the editor-in-chief and others are very involved in this field. And so uh, we have been, uh, we've been working on this actually from the very beginning. Uh, we, we made some of the first devices um, about 10 years ago where you know, the idea is in flexible electronics is to put uh, high performance materials on flexible substrates like plastics, like paper, like uh, 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 glass. And so we started with plastics. Here is Capton, a very popular uh, plastic sheet. And we really struggled actually uh, to get good quality performance. This is a schematic of graphene on the Capton. And uh, the properties were actually uh, very, very bad, our first set of properties. Uh, and this is because this uh, 
flexible or plastic materials are not designed for electronics. The surface of this Plastics are very, very rough, and so they degrade uh, the electronic performance that you can get. Uh, an additional problem that we encountered is that uh, when you put high-performance materials on plastic uh, and you're, going, you're, you're driving a lot of current through this uh, high-performance materials like graphene, that's going to lead to very uh, uh, localized hotspots within the plastic because the plastic does not have high thermal conductivity. It's not a high thermal management material. So uh, basically the current is going to lead to heating of the plastic and you're going to get to hotspot that will damage irreversibly the device. So we, we observe these two fundamental problems and how do you solve this problem? One way to solve this problem, our third generation device is to use HBN, which I've mentioned earlier. HBN is not only very good because it's a very high quality smooth interface, but HBN is a very good thermal management material. So it allows you to manage the heat generated in the graphene uh, as you pass a lot of current and also at the same time protect the heat from getting to the plastic substrate. So this is a skin, you know, image of optical image of the device. And with this, we could get very good uh, uh, current, uh, good uh, symmetry in the positive and negative and uh, overall uh, state-of-the-art uh, transistor, uh, graphene transistor properties on plastic. Another solution is to use uh, um, smoother uh, uh, flexible substrates. And so one option is flexible glass. So flexible glass can handle more heat than flexible plastic. It's not as flexible as plastic, but it's still flexible enough for certain applications. So for that, in that case, we could get 100 gigahertz. So these are record uh, uh, speed uh, of frequency performance uh, for graphene on flexible substrate. That's very important for 5G, for uh, uh, terahertz imaging, and so on and so forth. So what if you want to realize uh, flexible digital electronics? In that case, graphene is not sufficient, as I mentioned, because it's not a true semiconductor. So uh, MOS2 is a true semiconductor. It has a very good band gap. So uh, the first work on the flexible uh, devices, uh, transistor devices, was by um, uh, Professor Iwasa Sa, uh, San and Takinobu San, where they show that you could uh, put this on the same flexible substrates I mentioned in the previous slide, capton or polyamide, and you could actually get good flexibility uh, and relatively decent uh, uh, electrical properties. However, uh, the mobilities were quite low and the on-off ratio also quite low. So these are not satisfactory for a variety of digital flexible electronics. So we started working on this around the same time. And instead of using ion gel, uh, which is one way of making a flexible transistor, we use completely solid state uh, 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 materials for the construction of the flexible transistor, including high K dielectric, uh, also placing this on a polyamide substrate. With this, we can get very, very high on-off ratio, which is very important for digital. You know, you need uh, a good separation from the on and the on-off state to operate it as a switch. And then we could get very high sub-threshold slope, which is a measure of how good your digital transistor is. Um, so this is advanced to walk and the mobility was also very good. So with this, we could make uh, flexible radio circuits. I'll just show you some of the circuit elements and also a demonstration of a radio, beautiful work by one of my, uh, several of my former students. So you can make amplifiers. Amplifiers are of course very important uh, uh, for communication systems. You, you're getting all this weak signals from the antenna in your phone. You need to amplify this so we can make flexible amplifiers from these 2D materials. We could make frequency doublers. Uh, again, in your, in your smartphones or your laptops, uh, there are many circuits that have been realized to uh, increase the frequency. So uh, convert the frequency from low to high or from high to low. So these are basic building blocks that we can also realize with 2D materials. And then combining this, we, we were able to demonstrate a flexible radio. So this is just a optical picture schematic of this. So you can use a phone uh, as the music source, your favorite music, send it to a, a, a function generator that can broadcast this through an antenna wirelessly. So in this case, we focused on 
uh, amplitude modulated uh, signal. And then we use the 2D material as the flexible demodulator. So this is a single transistor, very similar to the kind of radio systems uh, uh, in, in uh, automobiles and in cars, let's say, uh, uh, 80 years ago. And then if you successfully demodulate the signal, you should be able to recover the music and play it in a speaker. And so this is what um, you would have heard uh, on this uh, moving video. And you can go on YouTube and watch uh, uh, Beethoven. Uh, this is playing the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven. You can watch it on YouTube to see how good the quality of the sound is from a flexible radio made of 2D materials. <clears throat> so another important application are interconnect. Interconnect are the wiring systems that are used in integrated circuits. And so uh, one of the challenges of current interconnect based on copper, which are in the integrated circuits, is that the current density is not uh, very high, especially as you go to smaller and smaller uh, uh, chips. So graphene, especially graphene nanoribbons, uh, were, was already identified about a decade ago as having a uh, hundred times higher breakdown current density than copper. That means how much current it takes before the material breaks down, electrically breaks down. So that's a very, very important metric for uh, uh, semiconductor technology. So a year later, we started, uh, we demonstrated that you could actually integrate these graphene ribbons on uh, uh, semiconductor chips. This is a uh, uh, graphene on a uh, uh, semiconductor chip that we made at Taijidian, uh, TSMC in Taiwan. And uh, we did back end of the line processing to integrate graphene on the very final layer of the semiconductor chip. However, the performance was not very good as predicted in theory, but since then there's been much, much progress in graphene interconnect for semiconductor integration. And I just cite the work of Costa Banerjee at uh, UCSB, where by doing a little bit of chemistry where they intercalate the graph, uh, graphene nanoribbons, they can increase the conductivity dramatically. And uh, the important thing is uh, as you go down to advanced semiconductor uh, technologies, um, the dimensions of the wire become smaller and smaller. So copper becomes more and more unre unreliable, but graphene actually improves as you go to smaller dimensions. So it's very good for scaling uh, of semiconductor wiring. And one of uh, the last application that I'll highlight as major advancements over the last 10 years are sensor technology. So uh, we show the first graphene integrated sensor with semiconductor, silicon semiconductor chip uh, a few years ago where graphene was used here, as very simple gas uh, sensor. Uh, uh, and so using our technique, we're able to integrate graphene on the final layer. The readout electronics was done in Silicon, this is also a chip made um, uh, that we designed and made uh, a Taijidian, a TSMC. You can see the graphene here, and this works very well as a gas sensor. Uh, uh, my very esteemed colleagues, Frank Coppins at, uh, in Barcelona, ICFO, they showed um, an optical sensor uh, to realize a so-called graphene camera. Uh, at the same time as we showed our paper here, yeah, they use quantum dots uh, to absorb the light, and graphene is the electrode uh, to uh, convert the uh, light to electricity. And then you can use silicon as the readout uh, uh, electronics. And the beautiful thing about this camera is it's very broadband. You can use it also uh, in the infrared for night vision. And uh, there's been a lot of progress on graphene sensors. Uh, I just cite the product from uh, Cardia Bio. Uh, so uh, they actually have commercialized graphene biosensors, and uh, some of these are actually available uh, to be purchased on the market. And uh, to be quite uh, 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 responsive to the urgent global situation, we've, we've focused now our sensor work 
on sensing the um, COVID-19. So in this case, we can also, we're using graphene and then you can functionalize this uh, graphene with linker molecules. This linker molecules allow you to bind uh, to the antibodies of the corona uh, COVID-19. So, you know, the antibodies is what is what the body produces uh, that is specific to fight a virus. So these antibodies are commercially available for the uh, COVID-19. And so by putting this and uh, uh, placing this on graphene, it provides a degree of selectivity that you cannot otherwise get. And now when you have a droplet uh, in a point of care device, which we're working on a droplet of this virus, it can now uh, linked to the antibody, and then there'll be a change in the resistance. So this is what we're doing. And the wonderful thing about this kind of platform, you know, other people are doing similar platforms as well, is that you can also just change the antibody, and then you can also uh, um, sense the flu. So with this kind of platform, you can do multiple diagnostics uh, for both the uh, coronavirus and the flu all on the same uh, chip. So with that uh, perspective on the last uh, 10 years of progress on two-dimensional materials, uh, especially in electron devices, uh, I'm now going to focus on the next 10 years, uh, the future, you know, from now uh, uh, for the next 10 years. What are the hardest areas uh, of applications? Um, so one of them is in negative capacitance transistors. Uh, so this is uh, a transistor device in which you're using the 2D material as the semiconductor channel, and then you're using, you know, a ferroelectric, for example, as the gate dielectric. Uh, so this could be HZO, uh, and then when you do this, you can get a very, very energy efficient transistor. So today in your uh, consumer products, there are billions of transistors on chip. So if you can get energy efficiency per transistor, when you combine a billion of them, the energy efficiency will be very, very dramatic. That's very important for battery life, for performance, and for a variety of things, uh, uh, cloud storage, uh, and so on and so forth. So a lot of interest here uh, in this kind of transistor devices. Uh, there's also a lot of activity in memory. So in fact, uh, in today in electronics, uh, uh, memory is the most important uh, component. That's why, you know, if you want to buy a smartphone or a laptop, uh, uh, the memory is going to determine the final price that you're going to pay for this gadget. So the 2D materials are also being explored for memory, and uh, those memory can also be used for uh, so-called neuromorphic computing, which is a, a nice way of saying brain-inspired computing. And then uh, uh, and the final area I, I expect to experience a lot of activity over the next 10 years uh, is printing and printed and wearable devices. So I'm actually gonna speak uh, uh, today, I'll speak about some of our work on memory and some of our work on wearable uh, devices. So memory effect. Um, there are many kinds of memory today and this memory is used different uh, operation uh, mechanisms in physics. So the most uh, common memory today, dominant memory is the flash memory. Uh, this is a semiconductor transistor device that is being, has been uh, configured to operate as a memory rather than a transistor. So it consumes a lot of space. Uh, so that is why there's a great interest in so-called emerging memories. And so this include ferroelectrics that take advantage of spin, phase change that take advantage of heat, solid elect electrolytes um, that uh, you know takes advantage of the electrochemistry and likewise metal oxide, so-called RAM. So the latter two are colloquially uh, called memristas. And so this is um, really the focus of this section of my talk. So what is the basic physics of memristas? Uh, let me, allow me to use this slide. So, Memory stores is really an application of defects uh, in a material. So when you have a dielectric material or insulating material and you sandwich it between metal electrodes, so this is so-called MIM, two terminal device. So because of the dielectric is non-conducting, if, if you measure the current versus voltage, you see that there's virtually no current flowing vertically between these two electrodes. Even though there's some defects within the dielectric, in general, there's no current flowing. 
So when you apply a very high voltage, very, very similar to the lightning effect, which is the an analogy that I like to give. So in the lightning effect, you think of the sky as the top electrode, like the metal, and you think of the earth as the bottom electrode. Uh, 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 so that's global. And then the, the atmosphere, the air is like an insulator. So when you have a very high voltage from the sky, it breaks down the air molecules, and then you can get current flowing from the sky to the earth. So that's how you get lightning. So a memory effect in this uh, uh, um, nanoscale is very similar. When you apply very high voltage, you can get, you can ionize the dielectric, and then you can have a conductive path or conductive filament that allows current to flow from the top electrode to the bottom electrode. So now when you measure the current versus voltage, you see that there's current flowing. So the beautiful thing about this is that you can, re you can uh, reverse this process many, many times. So in the beginning, people could do it, researchers could do it, let's say a few hundred times, but now this process can be uh, uh, reversed and reused uh, hundreds of millions of times. And in some cases, even billions and billions of cycles. So uh, from a fundamental point of view, technology integration, there's a, a great interest to reduce the size of these so-called memory cells, emerging memory, so that you can have a greater memory density, right? Memory density, density is very important for consumer and a variety of applications, right? So uh, if you can reduce the size in X, Y, and Z, uh, then you can have higher three-dimensional density. Uh, also, if you can make it thinner, the thickness of the uh, dielectric coactive layer, that allows you to have so-called forming-free. Uh, it's a low-voltage application. And then uh, it's also smarter. Smarter, we mean by lower energy to switch on the memory and switch it off. And then also by making it smaller, especially the thickness, you can have a faster switching time. So many advantages come from thickness scalability. However, the existing materials being used for memory, like metal oxides, uh, have a lot of issues. Uh, there's a lot of leakage uh, as you make this thickness, this uh, active layer smaller, the defects can now short the top electrode to the bottom electrode. And so that compromises the on-off ratio and altogether it's a very unreliable uh, memory cell. So, and the main fundamental reason why these issues exist is because this metal oxides using this RAM or CBRAM uh, are disordered materials. They're not high quality materials. They're very, very disordered. So I started thinking maybe 2D materials can solve this uh, thickness problem because 2D materials, you can get kind of metallic properties from graphite. You can get insulating uh, uh, properties uh, from HPN and dielectric uh, properties from MOS2 or similar materials. And this class of materials, this 2D materials are all crystalline, especially in the mono layer. They, they allow you to have the thinnest material, but also the highest quality crystalline material. So our simple idea when we started this in 2015 was, uh, Let's just replace existing memory, replace the dielectric layer with a single monolayer of MOS2. So this is less than one nanometer thick. So previously, people had not reached this uh, thickness regime before because of the issues I mentioned uh, about this leakage. So at that time, the popular opinion was that this idea was not going to work because, as I mentioned, um, uh, uh, the thinking was that if it was too thin, you get a lot of leakage uh, from the top to the bottom. But my student, uh, Rui Jing uh, Gay, who just graduated a few months ago, uh, convinced me that, oh, we should still pursue this idea. Anyway, I encourage all my students to take very high risk, especially if they're in their first or second year uh, PhD program. This is the best time to do high risk research because if the research doesn't work, it's not a big deal. This is the best time to fail. And then you still have a few more years, at least in the US, the PhD can take five years or more. You still have several more years uh, to get results uh, for a PhD uh, degree. So Rui Jing was actually very successful. So within the six months, uh, first six months, she was able to show that in fact, 
it is possible to get memory operation from the 2D uh, semiconductor, in this case, MOS2. These are typical memory results. So in the beginning, uh, we call this the high resistance state. That means the current is very low. And then at a certain high voltage, suddenly the current jumps up to what we call the low resistance state. Um, and so these two states, uh, the uh, uh, high current and the low, low current, uh, represent the memory on and off uh, that can be used, for example, for information storage. These are so-called non-volatile memory. That means they retain the information about the state even when you remove the power. So the way to test this is so-called retention studies. You turn off the power and you read the resistance or current in the state. And you see over the period of one week until the student got tired, uh, the, resist the current or resistance in the two states were relatively very stable. So we faced a lot of technical uh, um, debate uh, when we first started sharing this result. And this is very normal in scientific studies. Uh, when you have very, very new results that have not been seen before, it's very normal and very healthy to have a lot of debate regarding uh, the nature of the results. So uh, the basic thing then is we reached out to many colleagues to get samples of all sorts of two-dimensional materials grown by all sorts of methods. And we're able to confirm that this phenomena uh, in this two-dimensional uh, uh, memory is an intrinsic phenomena. It's not because of a parasitic effect. It's actually inherent uh, uh, phen uh, uh, phenomena that one can observe. So we collectively, we call this atom resistors. Uh, it just means that mem resistors are with an atomically thin layer. So now we've been able to show towards uh, a, a greater class of materials that this may be a universal effect. We've shown it in MOS2, which is the most popular 2D uh, um, semiconductor, but also the other 2D semiconductors like MOSE2, WSE2, WS2, all of them show similar properties. There's some variations that we're trying to understand. And we've also shown this in the thinnest 2D material that is known as an insulator, which is HBN just 0.3 nanometer um, thin, and this has very, very nice memory effect as well. So the question is, what is the mechanism of this effect? Uh, so we started looking into atomistic methods to look at the atomic details uh, in order to understand this. So STM is one of the best methods to do atomic studies, uh, especially in this kind of STM studies uh, with my postdoc, Saban, uh, we can use the STM tip uh, to do imaging. So this is a clean area of the material. And then we can also find areas that have defects. So this white circle are defective areas that are missing atoms of sulfur. And then we can do transport locally in these areas. So in the very clean areas, we get uh, ordinary results, very diode-like uh, current voltage characteristics, uh, nothing unusual. But in the defective areas, we see uh, the emergence of memory effect. Uh, so this hysteresis means that there's a memory effect. So now uh, we know for sure that defects are playing a role in the memory. And so I'll just illustrate the mechanism that we have learned from this uh, uh, years of study. So when you have this 2D material like MS2, you have gold atoms. Uh, the first thing is you have dissociation. Uh, so the electrochemistry uh, during high voltage allows some of the gold atoms to get loose, they dissociate, and then they can occupy the sulfur vacancy. And then uh, during the high voltage, uh, when they occupy the sulfur vacancy, that's what we call the set operation. The resistance of the MOS2 suddenly uh, reduces a lot. So then it's in the on state. And so this process can be recycled uh, uh, and the gold can be removed and it can return to the off state and it can be recycled many, many times. So this is the basic mechanism. So it's a, what we call a conductive point uh, switching effect, uh, which is different from another kind of mechanism known as the conductive bridge switching effect. So there are several applications. Let me just highlight uh, a few of them. One is in storage. And so for storage, you need uh, a num you need a very high endurance or to be able to cycle this many times. So um, Feng Miao's group in Nanjing has done very nice work showing that 
uh, with uh, thicker layers of MOS2, especially if you oxidize it a little bit, you can get millions of cycles from uh, this sort of thing. You can also use it for computing. Uh, in that case, uh, very nice work has emerged from, for example, Samsung and Harvard, where they use this for uh, neuromorphic computing. You can have programmable analog uh, resistance states, which are very important for that application. Uh, uh, Mario Lanza's group has also shown uh, using HBN that you can also have many, many programmable resistance states. And for all of these applications, energy uh, of switching energy is very important. So Han Wang's group at USC has shown that, again, by using a little bit of, introducing a little bit of oxygen into these materials, you can get um, auto joules uh, 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 energy consumption, which is very low. In fact, uh, we just have new work with Mario Lanza, just published uh, 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 this week, where we are now approaching zeta joules of energy. So the record low energy switching. So we, in my group, has been focused on new applications. So one of them is in uh, 5G connectivity, 5G communication systems. In that case, you need components that can work all the way up to 100 gigahertz. And so uh, uh, this is a new application of memory switches. And the idea is uh, you need to be able to achieve very low ohm resistance. And if you can do that, especially less than 10 ohms, um, then that will be suitable for the RF uh, systems because RF systems, the characteristic impedance is 50 ohms. So less than 10 ohms, then it's in the on state. That means you could have close to lossless uh, transmission of signal across uh, the switch. And then in the off state, it needs to have greater than kilo ohm and uh, relatively low capacitance. And then it will block the 5G signal from going from the input to the output. So altogether, the figure of merit uh, in this component is called the uh, cutoff frequency figure of merit, which is inversely proportional to the uh, RC product. And so you need to be above a terahertz figure of merit for this uh, component to be uh, competitive. So we did the study. I won't go too much into the details for the sake of time, uh, but we're able to achieve very, very high frequency performance um, in this uh, 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 eight, uh, materials uh, using, in this case, MOS2. We've done the same with HVN. Uh, for those of you familiar with uh, high frequency measurements, so this is the loss in the on state. You want it to be close to zero dB. So we see already the results are very close. It's very flat all the way to our measurement limit of 70 gigahertz. In the off state, you want it to be as negative as possible. That's what we call isolation. That means it's blocking the signal. And altogether, we have a figure of merit uh, nowadays, we're getting uh, more than 100 terahertz figure of merit. So that's record uh, RF, uh, RF switch component uh, superior to other materials made from uh, uh, MEMS or phase change or transistor devices. So now let me move on to um, the next topic, which is uh, on wearable sensors. I mentioned this is one of the hot areas looking into the future, the next 10 years of 2D materials. So the basic idea that um, I want to emphasize is that the human body is an electrical machine. So that means if you measure any two points of the human body, you can measure an electrical current across those two points. You can measure an electrical voltage across those two points. And those electrical signals can be correlated to a variety of things, including the health, uh, uh, the physical or mental health, the athletic uh, performance, uh, uh, and the comfort and um, hydration of the person. So a very important data about yourself. And so this has been uh, uh, developed many, many uh, decades ago, uh, where they use bulky wires and they place those wires on different parts of the body. And for example, on the head, uh, you know, so-called EEG, uh, that was shown to correlate with mental and brain health. And on the, on the chest area, uh, cardiac and heart health. Uh, and so these were clinical applications. And then about 10 years ago, uh, John Rogers and colleague, uh, uh, my good colleague, Nan Shilu Dayong Kim at SNU now, uh, show that uh, if wires could uh, be used for measuring these electrical signals, then uh, all you really need is conductive material. 
So there's no need to use conductive wires. You could also go to conductive thin films of metal like aluminum, uh, gold, copper. And if you, if you optimize the mechanics and place these materials on the skin, which is very soft, you should be able to get the same quality of signals as you get from these big wires. So the answer to that question is yes, you can get all this signal quality and at a very small portable form factor. So this led to the field of epidermal or tattoo electronics and has opened up uh, a lot of opportunities uh, for uh, this sort of electronics. So I started thinking about this and I thought, well, if all you need is a very conductive material uh, and you also want this material to be very thin, which has been uh, the direction of research for the last 10 years, then the ultimate conductive thin material that is also transparent is graphene. So maybe graphene can also work as a tattoo electrode sensor. So it turns out indeed it works. You can use graphene tattoos to measure these electrical signals from different parts of the body. It's ultra light. So we say that it's imperceptible. You don't feel it when you wear it and it's transparent and it has many of the benefits of the metal thin films. So this uh, uh, epidermal uh, wearable sensors has, has now led to the field of mobile health. Uh, you can also use them for monitoring athletic performance and also for human machine interface. So uh, many new directions to benefit society. So I won't go into the details. You can read some of our papers on this with Nan Shu Lu, um, but the main idea is that we've developed this now that they're uh, readily uh, integratable on the skin using temporary tattoo paper, uh, using a water release layer, you can transfer the graphene material, uh, monolayer material supported by thin uh, polymer onto the skin. So it doesn't require any adhesive layer. It sticks naturally to the skin. It's very, very stretchable, very breathable. It can last on the skin for several days. And after several days, it just naturally uh, comes off the surface of the skin because your skin is shedding uh, uh, routinely. So very flexible uh, and straightforward. And with this, when you develop this kind of technology for the first time, you have to benchmark it uh, against existing uh, technology in order to establish that it can get the uh, same quality of, quality of signals. So we've done ECG measurements. Those are the electrical signals from the chest area, from the heart. We see the graphene uh, gives similar or comparable results. We've done EMG, which is muscle activity and a variety of physical, physiological measurements, temperature, uh, uh, skin hydration. So the conclusion is the graphene electrodes can give similar or better quality signals, even though they're much thinner and they're completely uh, uh, transparent. And you can also put them on sensitive areas of the body, such as the eyelids. And there you can measure the EOG that uh, comes about from the electrical signals from moving the retina. So different directions of your eye movement lead to different types of signals that you can now use machine learning to understand where this person is looking at. And surprisingly, you, you can detect, you can uh, detect uh, the direction of moving movement of the person's eyes to win within one degree of precision. So using this EOG eye commands and machine learning, uh, uh, we developed a human machine interface where the subject here is wearing the graphene uh, sensors on the eyelids and using the eye movement to command this drone. Uh, there's a wireless uh, transponder at the back of his head that sends the command of the eye to the drone. So this is a you know, relatively simple example of a human machine or human robot interface. So now we're focusing our, a lot of our wearable research on vital sign monitoring. So one of the most important vital signs when you go to the hospital is the uh, blood pressure. Uh, and so being able to measure this in a comfortable manner uh, continuously and then send the si signal to let's say it's a smartphone, is of great interest for a variety of health uh, 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 diagnostics. So we've, we've started trials already, hundreds of measurements have been made, and we're getting clinically uh, acceptable uh, uh, systolic and diastolic measurements. And this results uh, with my good colleague, uh, Ruzbe Jafari, 
Uh, we're going to be publishing it uh, fairly shortly. The main idea is that uh, we're using bioimpedance. So uh, when blood is flowing through the arteries, uh, depending on the pressure of the blood, the impedance that you measure uh, uh, of this, because uh, the blood uh, and the uh, arteries are conductive, um, the impedance you measure will reflect uh, the pressure in this blood vessel. So and you, you have to do some signal processing, but altogether it's a straightforward uh, 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 application of these materials that we're developing right now. And there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of opportunity for graphene and 2D materials in uh, uh, all sorts of uh, sensors for health. And so I took this image from the NICE review by Professor Li Tao Son at Southeast University. Uh, and so you can, you know, graphene can be used in invasive applications uh, all the way from the nervous system to uh, biomechanical applications. It can also be used for non-invasive measurements, biophysical, uh, the ones that I talked about, this electrophysiological, and also biochemical and so on and so forth. So uh, for those of you interested in this, type of applications, you find a lot of opportunity for fundamental research and for discovery research that can benefit society. So with that, let me conclude. I think I'm uh, running out of time. So the grand electronic applications of 2D materials are mostly focused on electronics. The grand applications are to integrate these materials with existing semiconductor technology because that's a, you know, you know, big, big industry that is uh, of great importance to all of us uh, um, in the world. So being able to use the novel and unique properties of these 2D materials, combining with the maturity of semiconductor can advance uh, many, many, many applications. And then another one, which I consider revolutionary because it needs to be built. Uh, it's, not, it's not an existing developed mature technology, is flexible uh, electronics. And so there's been a lot of progress on row to row, manufacturing of these two-dimensional materials, and then one can uh, integrate them on different flexible platforms, all the way from wearable uh, to uh, um, flexible uh, gadgets. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, mem memory, there's actually a lot more that I can talk about uh, with regards to 2D materials for memory. I've really only talked about this MIM uh, uh, memory kind of device, emerging memory, but 2D materials can also be used in existing memory like flash memory. It can be used in 3D uh, memory structures, in phase change memory to control the heat, uh, in ferroelectric memory. So for those of you interested more in memory, you find uh, 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 the review article we wrote interesting and then there are references there that can guide you to other literature that are very interesting in this field. So I didn't really dwell too much on transistors. Uh, transistor is a very, still very, very important device. Again, there are many kinds of transistors. I really only mentioned this classical transistor device here. And uh, I said a word about the negative transistor, negative uh, capacitance transistor, but there are other kinds of transistors also being explored. Again, uh, you find uh, the literature uh, reference here, a good read for those. So with that, I'd like to uh, conclude the talk and acknowledge all my very esteemed collaborators across the world. Uh, I collaborate across many regions, so we're very, very grateful for their uh, expertise in bringing some of these ideas uh, from the lab into um, towards practical applications. And then our very generous sponsors, uh, we're very grateful to have, again, sponsors across, uh, across the world from different regions supporting basic research and uh, engineering applications. And I'd like to conclude by just highlighting uh, the importance of education. I'm very glad to have been invited to give this talk. And I think it's wonderful that uh, uh, this kind of seminar series are going to uh, further the education of all of us. And so one of the things we've been learning recently is uh, in addition to scientific and engineering courses, it's increasingly important nowadays to also have um, entrepreneurial courses and business type courses so that when we have a good idea, we can help to bring this technology, bring these ideas from the engineering lab, from the science lab 
towards applications. And so one important concept that I want to emphasize is that uh, we need to embrace failure. Um, so when you do research, uh, discovery research, uh, one has to accept the fact that uh, uh, very likely uh, one has to fail many times before one is successful. So uh, uh, this is very important, especially nowadays in entrepreneurial uh, uh, engagement and entrepreneurial uh, development of uh, new materials and new technology. So with that, I'll conclude and I'll be very happy to welcome any questions. Thank you. Hi, Tej. Uh, thanks for your wonderful session. And our staff have collected some questions from different live platforms, for example, YouTube, Facebook, and the BDBD. Yeah. I will ask the questions on the yeah. on behalf of the audience. Yeah, thank you. So the first question thank is uh, for graphene sensor you just mentioned, yeah. Uh, especially for COVID nineteen. Yeah, can it be used to selectively detect different viruses? Thank you. Yes, um, so graphene, uh, let's see if I can find the page. So whether graphene can be used to detect different viruses. Yes, this kind of platform, which you know, we are working on and several other groups across the world are working on, can be used to detect different viruses. Because the key thing here is graphene is very sensitive to everything. So one has to functionalize it to make it selective to a specific virus. So the way to functionalize it is to use the antibodies. The antibodies is the natural mechanism that the body develops uh, that is specific to a specific virus. So if those antibodies are available, uh, then this kind of platform can be developed to be sensitive only to that virus. So the short answer is yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you. The winter is coming. Yeah, you mentioned uh, so the virus will become yeah, more and more <laughs> and stronger. Yeah. So it's beautiful. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. And the second question is for atomic layer MOS2. You may, yeah. Uh, how to make a gold atom occupy the cipher vacancy? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, let's see. Um, so in that case, let's go to the mechanism. So it turns out that um, gold atom uh, is very favorable to occupy the sulfur vacancy from an energy point of view. And many groups have studied this theoretically. Some have even measured this experimentally. Uh, gold uh, is energetically very favorable to occupy a sulfur vacancy. So it's not uh, the energy involved is very reasonable. So when you apply uh, either thermal energy or electrical energy, the gold atom can spontaneously uh, um, occupy the sulfur vacancy and it can be removed when you apply the reverse energy. Uh, it can be removed from the sulfur vacancy. So not just the gold atom, but many kinds of metal atoms can occupy the sulfur vacancy. So if, if you can send me an email, uh, I can send you some publications that discuss this in detail. Okay, thanks for your response. Uh, third question is, uh, is it possible to control the thickness of MOS2 and the tune the conductivity? Yes, yes. Uh, it's, it's nowadays uh, becoming more and more routine uh, to be able to control the thickness of the MOS2. For example, through methods such as metal organic chemical vapor deposition, which is a method of uh, synthesizing or manufacturing this material, you can control the thickness one layer, two layer, three layer, four layer, and there are other methods like this that can get you 20, 20 layers, 50 layers, and 100 layers. So this is becoming a more and more uh, routine technique uh, in the scientific field. Okay, thank you. Another question. Okay, I translate. Uh, what's the current, uh, what's the current uh, challenge and the perspective of printable and uh, uh, printable and the wearable devices for 2D materials? Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, that's a very, very relevant question. Um, so there, there are several challenges from technical challenges to business challenges. So for example, business challenge 
means you, you need to be able to make this wearable or printable uh, devices uh, at a very, very low cost uh, uh, for these applications because printable uh, um, technology uh, is considered a low cost technology. So that means uh, the way you prepare the material and you integrate them all have to be uh, in a very cost friendly, competitive uh, 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 approach. So that is ongoing work. That's why people are doing a lot of research to grow these materials in very large area at very low cost. There are also technical uh, challenges, for example, and uh, one of them is how do you integrate this material on a flexible substrate? So right now, uh, many of these 2D materials are not grown directly on a flexible substrate. They're grown on another substrate like metal substrate for the case of graphene, and then they're transferred onto the flexible substrate. So that's a process issue that can introduce defects, that can introduce uh, dirt and contamination, and it's also an, an additional step. So there's, a, there's ongoing research, especially for some of these 2D materials, whether you can grow them at high quality directly on some flexible substrates, and then you can just use that directly uh, for those uh, applications. There are other technical challenges, uh, uh, and uh, I'll be happy to discuss it offline. Okay, thank you. And uh, another question. Uh, so for this flexible and uh, wearable devices, uh, is harmful to human skin? Yeah, thank you. No, uh, so these are not harmful, so we call this epidermal uh, um, sensors. So that means they're on the surface of the skin. They're not inside the skin like a normal tattoo ink will go inside your skin. This is on the, on the surface. So it's very safe. It comes off naturally and it's not harmful to the skin. So in fact, it's biocompatible. Oh, I, I do question, same baby with the police question. Uh, what's the current challenge and perspective of 2D materials? Oh, so big for this question. Uh, that's a very big question. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, there are many, many, many challenges. Uh, there's challenges in, in every aspect um, because you have to keep in mind, as I showed in the beginning, these are relatively young materials. So there's challenges in material science, there's challenges in electrical engineering, there's challenges in the mechanics of this material, there's challenges in electrochemistry, uh, and there's even challenges in measurements, measurement science and characterization. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity uh, and ongoing opportunity uh, on research across the entire science and engineering of these materials. Okay, uh, thanks for your response to all questions. Very solid for you. Yeah, yeah. Good, uh, good uh, night. Yeah. And thanks for your time. Uh, welcome thank to you. submit your paper to yeah, SmartMed. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yes, I look forward hey, to it. Thank so you. thank you yeah, very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good night. Good, good night. night. Thank good you night. for your great talk. Good night. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Maybe see you later. Okay. Cheers.